sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern. This week on Wall Street Wrap-Up, Elizabeth Holmes sentenced to 11 years in prison for her role in the Theranos fraud trial. And the fallout over the collapse of the cryptocurrency FTX exchange continues taking down other crypt exchanges, possibly exposing heavy donations to Washington politicians. And the producer price index was released this week and was lower than expected, delighting the street. I'm Andre Laborde. On this T plus one week to Black Friday, we've got these stories and more. It's Friday, and that means it's time for Wall Street Wrap-Up. Hi, I'm Andre Laborde. Welcome to Wall Street Wrap-Up on this Friday, November the 18th, 2022. I hope your week went well. Well, coming up tonight, we're going to be talking with Douglas Holtz Eakin. He's an economist and president of the American Action Forum. Doug's also the former director of the Congressional Budget Office, and he served on the Council of Economic Advisors in the Bush administration. And he'll be with us in just a moment. But first, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported this week the Producer Price Index, or PPI, which measures cost to manufacturers before going to retail clients. The PPI for October was cooler than expected, coming in at two-tenths of a percent versus the street's expectation of four-tenths of a percent. Well, this created a buying on Tuesday, but it was short-lived for the week, and the euphoria subsided. The reality crept back in, and it was down for the better part of the week, but it did end higher today on Friday. Well, for the year, for October 2021 to, the, to this past October, the PPI rose 8%, lower than analysts had estimated, which they were expecting to be at 8.3%. Well, the fallout from the collapse of the crypto exchange FTX continues to unfold with more details emerging. Last month, Sam Bankman-Fried was on the cover of Forbes' Richest People with a worth of over $16 billion. He was heralded by people such as CNBC's Jim Cramer as the next J.P. Morgan. Fortune magazine referred to him as the next Warren Buffett. In less than one month, the company he founded that had a value of over $40 billion is now in Chapter 11 bankruptcy. And Sam's worth, once over $16 billion, is at almost zero. The creditors that, as of last week, were thought to be over 100,000 are now to be thought to be over 1 million. Now it looks as if the founder and former CEO Sam Bankman-Fried was using the exchange to give money to political and climate change causes that he endorsed and into his own piggy bank run by his girlfriend, Carolyn Ellison. Ellison, who had no knowledge or experience in running an investment fund, except to be the fund's Girl, the girlfriend of Sam, was funneling over $2 billion of customer client money from FTX. Now, the new CEO of the bankrupt FTX is John Ray. He was appointed by the bankruptcy courts. Ray's job is to sort through all the carnage and possibly try to return some, if possible, some money to creditors of FTX. Ray, when seeing what had been done, said, Never in my career have I seen such a complete failure of corporate controls and such a complete absence of trustworth financial information as occurred right here. And... Ray knows a thing or two about this because John Ray was put in charge of Enron's misdeeds. And according to John Ray, this was worth, worse than Enron. Well, the S&P 500 was down nearly three quarters of a percent for the week. But for the day, all 11 sectors of the S&P ended higher. The Dow Jones ended the week at 33,747, just edged and up for the week. And this week, the S&P 500, they closed at 3,965. That was down six-tenths of a percent for the week. And the Nasdaq, they ended at 11,146, which was down one and a half percent for the week. Well, Douglas Holtz Eakin is former director of the CBO and president of the American Action Forum, and he's here with us tonight. Hi, Doug. Welcome to Wall Street Wrap-Up. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This week, the producer price index was released, and the numbers were better than expected. I mean, we had, uh, for, for the PPI, we had an year-over-year at 
eight percent, where I think the estimates were going to be at eight point three. Well, the market loved it and the market rallied on that. But I'm curious your thoughts when it comes to like the Federal Reserve. Last week we had uh, the CPI. And this week we had the PPI. Does the Federal Reserve put more emphasis in, let's say, the CPI rather than this metric, or do they weigh them equally? In the end, the, the Fed is interested in consumer prices, and their preferred measure of consumer prices is the uh, personal consumption expenditures price index, uh, but that only comes out quarterly. They get the CPI monthly, and so they focus on that. And I, I'll be honest, I was really surprised by the market's reaction to the CPI. It came in uh, modestly lower than we might have expected. And core CPI got back to where it was two months ago. It, didn't, it wasn't exactly falling off a cliff. And, and so when we got to today and it reacted roughly the same to the PPI, I thought, man, are they not listening? We, we are at 8%. We are so far from 2 uh, it's not even funny, and, and this is not an indication the Fed's going to stop a reverse course or anything like that. For the next meeting, which is going to be this December, uh, they're going to do 50 yep. more basis points. Do you think that coming into 2023, they're going to then um, hold off right then, or do you think that they'll continue to go based on the on the data that they get? Will maybe go maybe 25 basis points, or do you think they'll uh, 50 and hold, and that's it? So, so here's what I think, um, and, and I, I get to this conclusion just by listening to Chairman Powell. Um, he says, uh, we want to get to neutral as expeditiously as possible, and I think they've got to go another 50 basis points to get to neutral by the end of the year. Uh, he then says, we will need to have restrictive monetary policy for a sustained period to bring inflation under control. So that, to me, says they have to continue going up in 2023, and it's not going to be after waiting for a while, they, they need to get there and hold it for a, quote, sustained period. All of that sounds to me like a Fed that is marching north. And uh, whether they do it in 50 basis point increments or 25, I think uh, we shouldn't care. What ultimately matters is where they end up. Trying to turn the economy around is like trying to turn a battleship. Well, I can tell this story two ways. I'm a trained economist, so I'll give you one hand and the other hand, and here we go. Ready? Like, like Harry uh, Truman always wanted. He always wanted a one-armed <laughs> economist because on right. one hand, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's where this one goes. So, so the one that says keep raising is uh, the fact that 2022 has been the year of services inflation. Last year was goods, all the supply chains, things like that. This year it's services, and the poster child for services inflation is shelter. Shelter's a third of the consumer price index. Uh, last month, it was 6.9% year over year. That was up from 66 And indeed, it has risen every month since January 2021, has yet to show signs of moving down. Well, if you have a third of the CPI still headed up, that's uh, real strong evidence the Fed is going to continue to, to move up. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, everyone thinks that happens with a lag. People sign you know, leases once a year and and the pressures in the housing market are already starting to show up in lower rents, and we'll see that eventually. So if you're a forward-looking policymaker, you might anticipate that you've done enough and that inflation will come down in the, the, the months to come and that you don't need to do too much more. The only flaw with that story is the Fed has said that's not what they're going to do. They have said, we are going to look at the data, and when we see material improvement on a sustained basis, so give me a couple of months of it going down, then we'll think about pausing. I don't think we've seen that standard of evidence yet. And so just taking them at their word, uh, I think we've got more in the way of uh, rate hikes to come that does run the risk you do too much. And I think that's why a lot of economists are concerned about a potential recession mid to late 2023. And I would be on that list. This, this really raises the probability that in the end, they find out they did more than they needed to and pushed the economy down. In fact, this week, in fact, I think it was um, I think it was Bank of America uh, came out with uh, I think they said there was a 77 percent chance that there will be a recession, yeah. just like what you said in the, within the next 12 months. Well, then, of course, then that begs the question, uh, there's a hard recession or a soft, you know, hard landing, soft landing. And uh, based on what you're talking about, do you think that because we've got unemployment, uh, I mean, you've got um, you've got job people are looking for jobs. The labor participation rate is about what, 62.3 percent. So how does that equate sure. in the 
in the, the data that, that you're talking about? Tells you, number one, we're not in a recession. I mean, even though we got two quarters of negative GDP growth this year, I never thought we were in a recession. The, the job market was just way too strong. You have two openings for everyone looking for a job. You've got an unemployment rate that spent the year at 3.5%. It's bumped up slightly since. Um, it's creating hundreds of thousands of jobs a month. That, that's not recession territory. Going forward, I would say the key is business spending. Most people are looking at either the labor market, looking for the unemployment rate to tick up, and or they're looking at households, uh, consumer sentiment, how much of the their bank accounts have been drained away and hurt by inflation, things like that. But in every post-war recession, except the most recent one, which was the anomaly, that's the pandemic, that's the virus stopping people from spending money by going to restaurants and taking vacations and the like. Every other recession starts with a decline in business spending, and a quarter or two later the implications that show for the labor force and the household spending starts to fall. So I'm looking very carefully at indicators of the business community's appetite to spend. And when that starts to look like it's in trouble, the, the red flags go up. When you see this week, um, uh, Amazon is now saying that they're going to be laying off 10,000 employees. Um, yep. And prior to that, Meta, platform, Meta platforms or Facebook and uh, other, other companies like that, larger companies, but more tech, more tech companies, they're laying yep. off quite a bit of their workforce. Is this the first signs of what you're talking about? There are really a couple of groups out there that, that, that sort of separate. Number one, there's the housing market related folks. You know, housing just exploded during the pandemic and we're starting to see it cool down. And it's especially affected by the Fed's policy. And so they're leading the, the, the leading edge of this. Uh, then there's the tech companies. They seem to be a world unto themselves. Uh, they're all announcing layoffs, unlike uh, some of their, their comparably sized services uh, firms. Then there's the goods industry. There's the retailers. You see the Walmarts and, and them talking about how their earnings maybe aren't what they'd hoped. But I, I think the real thing to look for is when you get big service providers saying, you know, we're, we're cutting back on our on our CapEx, uh, we're not hiring, uh, th then we'll know that the Fed's attempts to bring services inflation under control are starting to have big impacts. And, and that'll be the real the real issue, I think. You know, Doug, something interesting happened that I saw this, this week that I'd, I'd never seen. Jeff Bezos, who founder of, of Amazon. Now, granted, yep. he's not the CEO anymore, so maybe he can talk freer. But he said, you know, and this was this week, he said, you know, with a, a pot with the probable recession, if you were thinking about buying that large screen TV, I'd maybe hold off. If you're thinking about that large purchase, I'd hold off. And I'm listening to this and I'm going, you, first off, it's right before Christmas, <laughs> right? And you're right. having the same thought right. that I'm And what's his business but Amazon? He probably sells more large screen TVs than uh, Best Buy or Macy's or something. But And I don't know if you heard that, but I'm going, so here he's saying, uh, I'd, I'd hold off on that. At least thus far, the, you know, the vaunted demise of the American uh, household spender has been wildly exaggerated. Um, you know, <laughs> it, when consumer confidence was very low, they went out and spent the money. When consumer confidence has come back up, they're out spending the money. Uh, by and large, the American consumer has been rock solid. Balance sheets remain in pretty good shape. Um, th there are a lot of people with a job. The unemployment rate's at 3.7%. I, I, I get your real wages aren't rising the way they used to, but there's still a lot of income being generated to support uh, household spending. And it's Christmas. I mean, you know, the holiday season is a, a, a time people go out and spend. So uh -huh. I, I don't expect, you know, this quarter, the fourth quarter of uh, 2022 to be the one where the problems show up. It, mm -hmm. It's next year. That's where the, the concerns start to rise. Yeah. Do this week also uh, the New York Fed stated that uh, credit card debt is now up nine hundred and thirty billion dollars. Uh, consumer credit card debt on there. And that's yeah. the, the largest over the last couple of years. Do you think that people are just going, well, like, l sort of like what you just saying, we're going to keep spending, we're, we're just going to put it on the credit cards? And the credit cards are low by historic standards. I mean, when you compare it to the past couple of years, you're talking about 2020, one of the strangest years in U.S. economic history, and 2021 as we climbed out. So, it's it's not easy to benchmark uh, using those as the, as the comparison years. You go back to the pre-pandemic, credit card debt was much higher. Um, delinquencies were much higher. So far, we don't see pervasive credit problems in the household sector. Uh, not like we saw 
you know, certainly uh, 2007, 2008, uh, and another recession. So uh, again, um, it, it can't last forever. If your real wages are falling and you're you're living off the one-time stimulus payments in the pandemic, that 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 trick runs out. But it, it hasn't run out yet, and the households still look like they're in pretty good shape. So do you think that there's still a lot of money that was left over from the such a slush fund of stimulus money that people yep. got so much of it, they're just still living on that? And that's why you've got a, a labor participation rate of 62 percent? And, and That money, which may not have come to them directly, but a lot of stimulus money went out. 10 percent of GDP in 2020, you know, two, $2 trillion. And then another $2 trillion in 2021. Um, that, that money is out there in the economy, and it's showing up in somebody's account. And, and I think that, that is powering some of the spending. And also, Doug, add to that, because, well, I read your newsletter, uh, is that uh, you've got the yeah. recent Inflation Reduction Act. They still haven't finished shoveling out all the money that was passed by Congress. Yeah, um, that, that's not an inflation reduction uh, piece of legislation. I think that's, that, that's been made clear. Um, but it does have an enormous amount of front-loaded spending, particularly for uh, clean energy subsidies, electrical vehicle subsidies. And uh, as that money goes out, that, that's going to add to the, the spending pressures. And so I, I don't see anything that Congress has done that's anti-inflationary. I don't see anything the administration has done that's anti-inflationary. Uh, the biggest thing is the president tried to forgive $420 billion of student debt. And so uh, all inflation fighting resides with the Fed. And Congress is never going to be their ally. They'll, they'll be directionally going the wrong way, probably not very big. The Fed can counteract it. But th this is really focus on the Fed time. Uh, they have one objective, which is to get inflation back to its target. They believe that objective is consistent with their mandate for full employment. And so th they're a single mandate Fed right now. It's all about fighting inflation. That it took Paul Volcker. He'd much rather be a Paul Volcker of the one who curbed the inflation problem than the one who created it. What he said in his uh, Jackson Hole speech was that the biggest mistake made back in that era was to, to ease prematurely. And Volcker did. Uh, they saw inflation expectations come down. They saw inflation come down a little bit. They eased and it took off. And then they had to really hammer the economy and have a big recession to control inflation. And so he said the biggest mistake the Fed could make would be to ease prematurely. So one of the reasons I, I said earlier, I think they're going to keep going because he has just flatly said, not going to make that mistake. Then it gets really good. He keeps talking about how they're going to keep at it. We're going to keep at it. He said at Jackson Hole. He said it at the news conference. Every regional uh, bank president goes out and says, we're going to keep at it. The title of Paul Volcker's autobiography is Keeping at It, the fight for uh, sound money and good government. I mean, you don't what, have to be I mean, Sherlock Holmes. You want to be Volcker? You want to be Volcker? I get it. They made a mistake. They misjudged the inflation early on. There's no way uh, uh, to get around that. But, but having started, they seem unlikely to quit early. So happy to have the former director of the Congressional Budget Office, Douglas Holtz Eakin. We're going to take a break, but don't go away. We're going to be right back. Right before going into a break, you were talking about the Federal Reserve and their quantitative tightening. Well, now, um, as of, an, I, I want to say it's March, that uh, March of this year, and now they're starting what's called quantitative tightening, which is now where they were uh, buying bonds and dumping the money in $120 billion a month into the economy. Now they're doing the opposite. Now they're trying to take this kind of money out. According to one of your last newsletters, and I don't remember which one it was, you, I thought you said that the Federal Reserve balance sheet was about $8.7 trillion. They started off, they, they didn't start off at a zero balance. They had about $800 billion already. So basically, they bought, they, uh, they dumped about $8 trillion into the economy. I, am I correct to say that, A, that they've stopped buying bonds, and are they also now doing the opposite of tightening, which is trying to take the money out of the economy by, by selling these bonds? 
Uh, yes, that's exactly what's going on. Now, they put that $8 trillion in, in two big tranches, one right after the, the Great Recession with the financial crisis. But, you know, starting with uh, the pandemic in March 2020, they, they pumped $5 trillion into financial markets. They're now going the other way. Uh, they're letting those uh, mortgage-backed securities and treasuries roll off their balance sheet. They have said they will actively sell them if they need to to, to get the portfolio down. Uh, for the average human being, that just means they're sucking that money back out. And it makes financial conditions tighter. There's less free money floating around for uh, for banks and others to use to, to supply credit. And we, we've really seen this most dramatically in the housing area because they were buying $30 billion a month of mortgage-backed securities, and they're now unwinding $35 billion a month. So they went from pumping $30 billion a month into mortgage finance. Now they're sucking $35 billion a month out. That swing, $65 billion, is something like a quarter to a fifth of normal mortgage finance. Well, mortgage finance conditions are extremely tight. Everyone knows this. And it's not just the rates. It's this uh, active quantitative tightening. It's having a bigger impact on the economy than I think the rates themselves would lead you to believe. You're, if you're taking $35, um, 35 billion out, but you dumped $120 billion a month in, uh, that that deficit is still out there into the economy. Do they have plans on taking that uh, that difference out? They're, they're going to get it all eventually. Yes. If I'm in the mortgage finance industry and I want to actually, you know, I found someone who actually wants a mortgage, I've got to get that money out of other uses of capital in the economy, and so I have to charge higher mortgage interest rates and and attract investors with higher returns, and and that just means the housing sector has a takes a special hit. They started off with about $800 billion. Do you think with the, the psychology of the Federal Reserve that they're going to eventually get back to that original $800 billion? Or even if they end up at $1 trillion, $2 trillion, whatever, they go, well, we, we paid down from 8.7 to 2 or 8.7 to 1.5. They, 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 that's not what they started off at. There's no target for the balance sheet. No one, no Federal Reserve official has stood up in public and said, it's got to be X. If it's not X, we have a problem. Instead. They've said our job is to get to full employment and price stability. And right now, the only way to get to full employment is at price stability. So whatever gets them to their 2% target, they will declare victory, and it'll, it'll end up where it ends up. And so uh, one hopes that that happens quickly and relatively uh, easily so that there isn't a big toll on the economy. But they have said that they will get there. And, and so that's a, that's a commitment I think they take very seriously. You've got the federal debt, which is what thirty-one trillion, thirty-two trillion, you know, yep. give, or, give or take a trillion. But yes. but what we're talking about now is the Federal Reserve balance sheet, which is eight point seven. That's yep. completely separate from the thirty-one trillion of the federal debt. Is that correct? Yes, those yeah. are. Uh, we have an independent Fed created by the Congress, but um, operating independently, and so it's managing its portfolio. It's got some things on it which are. Uh, mortgage-backed securities. It's got some holdings of foreign exchange. It's got all sorts of assets that, that constitute its balance sheet. The Treasury has debt of the federal government. Uh, these are liabilities of the of the U.S. Treasury. They come in all these different maturities that you know so much about: ones and twos and fives and tens and thirties. Uh, and that's the thirty-one trillion dollar number. That's the one I'm most concerned about, to be honest. That's a number that in the 21st century has only gone up, even relative to the size of our economy. We have only seen federal debt relative to GDP rise. We have never put together the political will to stabilize it. And until we do, I will be concerned. Just as recently, the last week or so, they've had a crypto exchange called FTX that has now gone under. And, um, you know, it, and every every moment as we speak, there's more things that are being uncovered from that. Uh, now it looks like there may be up to one million creditors, if not more. Uh, you're looking at maybe anywhere between 10 billion to 50 billion uh, in, in losses. And Enron, I think, was at 25 billion. And I say, I, I remember yeah. companies. I remember Enron. I also remember a, yep. a few years back there was a company, a, a hedge fund called Long Term Capital. I want to say 1998, yep. 1999, that the federal yeah. government had to kind of help bail that out. And in 2007, 2008, we had the real estate crisis of the banks. Do you see yep. that this crypto problem might be getting to the effect that we might have to, the, the federal federal government may have to be stepping in? I don't think so. Um, a, the asset class isn't that large. I mean, it's, they're big numbers, but, but compared to the size of 
uh, assets in equities and bonds and all across the economy. It's not a big asset class. It's also not interwoven in, in the large institutions' balance sheets the way the real estate especially was. And people aren't holding derivatives of subprime mortgages on the, on uh, the, of uh, crypto um, like they were the subprime mortgages. So I, I don't see this as a systemic threat. Um, you know, the more we hear about FTX itself, it, it sounds just like out and out uh, fraud and mismanagement. I mean, this is to the story we know today. It sounds a lot like, OK, well, I, I've got a company. I don't have a CFO, so no one's checking there. I don't have a board. They're not checking that. <laughs> um, yeah, I got. I, I got customers' money that I'm going to lend to my sister uh, corporation that I also run and let it um, invest it in these risky assets. And Boy, I've got a girlfriend. Terrible. My girlfriend is running my hedge fund that I'm giving money to there yes. as well, too. Yes. <laughs> as it turns out, there's always a girlfriend in these things. So, I mean, uh, right. you know, you know, how is it that someone like the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund is putting their money in FTX? But but people did. And And what we know about crypto as a class is that while... It has been advertised as something that the young and the, the daring and, and, and all that were getting into. If you look to it, where the big money was, it was seasoned professional investors. That's where the money was uh, put into crypto. And so the people who are going to get hurt here are going to be those same people who I expect to do better due diligence. I don't know what went on here. We'll find out more in the days and weeks to come. But, but it really looks like the people who put big money in there should have known better. I hope you come back and join us some more. It was wonderful to be here. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Doug. Well, if you've got a question about finance or a comment about the show, we want to hear from you. Make it pithy. Make it concise. Write us at Andre at WallStreetWrapUp.info. And now for a look ahead for market information for next week. But first, on this day in 1970, Douglas Engelbart obtained a U.S. patent for his XY position indicator. Well, what do we now know this device as? We'll have that answer in a moment. Well, on this day in 1970, Douglas Engelbart obtained a U.S. patent for his XY position indicator. What do we now know this device as? The computer mouse. Well, Thanksgiving is really less than a week away. And grocery stores are going to be packed with those wanting to shop for that dinner to give thanks for the people for throughout the year. And it's going to be more expensive with the turkey and all the trimmings. Now, an average 16-pound turkey will cost you this over 20% more this year, more than last year. Well, if you want to stuff that bird, that's going up almost 70% for the stuffing. And peas, that, are going to be, that will be going up 23%. And the dough that it'll cost you to buy the dinner rolls, well, that dough has risen 22%. And well, as a reminder, we repeat the show on Sunday mornings. Best way, though, is to set your DVR so you'll never miss an episode. That's our show for this Friday, November the 18th, 2022. Hope you enjoyed it. My thanks so much to Douglas Holtz Eakin for joining us this evening. But as always, it's you we appreciate for allowing us into your homes tonight. So remember, you can always follow us on all the social media on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and WYES.org. So enjoy your weekend ahead. Have a productive week as well. The markets are going to be closed on Thursday so everyone can enjoy their Thanksgiving. I'll see you next week. Remember, if it's Friday, it's Wall Street Wrap Up. I'm Andre Laborde. Happy Thanksgiving. Remember, money never sleeps. Good night. Sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern.